Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. Where tonight we're going to take a look at three-dimensional science teaching and learning. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough-to-teach, tough-to-learn concepts accessible to all my students. I'm really excited to be joined tonight by our two panelists, Peter McLaren and Jeff Lukens. Peter is the Executive Director of NextGen Education and works as a consultant with states and districts in support of the implementation of the state science standards based on the framework for K-12 science education. Peter also served as President of the Council of State Science Supervisors, and currently he serves as a science consultant for Texas Instruments. Peter, thanks so much for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here and talking with the educators today. And when he retired from teaching in 2014, Jeff had taught high school science for a short 34 years. He now delivers professional development across North America for the TQ organization as a full-time science instructor. He continues to author activities for all levels of science teachers and learners. Jeff, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Well, Mike, thank you. It's good to be here. And I've been retired for a really short five years. I wasn't going to mention it. Now we know. Everybody knows that now. If you have any questions tonight, feel free to use the Q&A window and pose those questions to Peter or Jeff. I know they'd love to try and get those questions answered. We're also going to be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, in the window with your name, the, the participant window, in the lower right-hand corner, you should be able to find an icon that looks like a telephone handle. If you click on that telephone icon, you'll receive call-in information, and you can switch from the default, which is the auto broadcast, over to using a phone, and that would uh, hopefully alleviate any further audio issues. At this point, Jeff is going to discuss our agenda. Great. Thanks, Mike. And good evening again, everybody. It's great to have all of you on here for what is probably a little bit kind of a different webinar for these Tuesday webinar series that we have. Um, can be strictly devoted, well, most of it devoted to science and standards-based science and activity development. So uh, we're really, really pleased that we have such a great crowd tonight. And, and here's what we, we are intending to accomplish tonight, the uh, agenda. Peter's going to take some time to describe for you um, what the next generation science standards structure is and the, the 3D or three-dimensional model of, of teaching and learning for teachers and for students. And then we're going to take a look at, and, we're, and, by, and back to that previous bullet, we're going to look at kind of the philosophy behind why we have uh, this new and maybe not so new uh, means of delivering science instruction. And then we're going to discuss and take a look at a, one of the sample lessons that uh, a team has developed that uh, displays the 3D model, a three-dimensional model of science teaching. And um, for those of you who are, are joining us who are math instructors and I'm, or math, math is your primary area, uh, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised at the, the inclusion of some of the math standards uh, tonight as we compare the science standards and the math standards side by side. Thanks, Jeff. And also, um, Jeff, would you mind discussing some of these expected outcomes for tonight? Sure. Be happy to, Mike. Uh, so here's our outcomes, as, and some of these are, are a bit repetitive from the previous uh, slide, um, and that's not Mike's fault. That's That's my fault. But we have uh, hopefully by in a very short time, you'll have at least a working understanding of what this 3D teaching and learning is all about, the three-dimensional model with science education. And um, the, the NGSS movement was sort of, well, not sort of, it's for those of you who are familiar with Common Core, this was similar to the, the uh, math movement of Common Core 
the next generation science standards are sort of the uh, sibling of that. And then we'll kind of take a look at the process of designing lessons that are three-dimensional in nature. And then as we mentioned before, uh, look at the connections between the NGSS and the Common Core State Standards. And if you think about that in the big picture, uh, we're connecting the science with the mathematics and those two letters, the science for S and the mathematics for M are the first and last letters in that acronym that we all have come to love and come to not understand as well as we probably could, and that's the STEM model. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight, and those are our outcomes. Jeff, thanks so much. Peter, you should have control. Feel free to share your screen. Thanks, Mike. Let's see here. All right. So I appreciate Jeff Jeff's introduction, and uh, certainly our expectations for the outcomes are uh, something that um, we we hold dear to us because we really want to make sure that this is a uh, transparent um, opportunity for to be able to demystify. 3D teaching and learning. And 3D, when we mention three-dimensional, there are no goggles. You don't have to worry about having a special screen. There is a, uh, it's a, it's a reference to some specific elements of an important document that we'll be talking about a little bit earlier, uh, excuse me, a little bit later on in this presentation. So let's move on a little bit, but I, I just want to be able, be able to point out something. The, the webinar is entitled Three-Dimensional Science, Teaching, and Learning, but I want to point out the work that Texas Instruments has done bringing together a science implementation team. And that team is, uh, we're fortunate to have one of them on this call tonight, Jeff Lucan, Stacy Thibodeau, who is a regular on these Tuesday night webinars, uh, but even, even the, the best teachers cannot get a chance to uh, to be able to participate all the time. She's she's jockeying around her children to different events tonight, but she's here with spirit. Um, Kathy hey, White Peter. Cotton. Yes, please. If you mind, uh, if, are, are you sharing your screen? Can we double check that? I thought we were. Did we get that? I'm not seeing your screen yet. All right, hang on. Let me go back. How about now? There we go. That looks great. All right, thanks, a little technical difficulty. By the way, with this technical difficulty, before I uh, went to the Council of State Science Supervisor, I was the Rhode Island uh, Science and Technology Specialist, so <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed for the fact I didn't share the screen well. So thanks, forgive me, please, folks. Uh, but I want to give a shout out again to Jeff Lucan, Stacey Thibodeau, and Kathy Whitecotton. This is the group that, that we, uh, we we recruited to take on this this work that we, that Jeff is going to describe a little bit more about um, about how to be able to help uh, teachers that are in states that are uh, that have three dimensional science standards and be able to uh, talk about how to be able to take good lessons and adapt them to be three dimensional. I should also mention the team takes takes in Eric Archer, who many of you know as being the, uh, the, the Wunderkinder behind all of the, the great bells and whistles of our innovative program and the rover and what have you. And Rhonda Cristoforo, who many of you know, is the TI State Policy Director. So great team, and I was very honored to be part of that group. So let's get started right now for a minute. And, and it all starts with a vision. You have to start somewhere, and where we start is a document that came out in 2012 called the, the Framework for K-12 Science Education. And this framework took the science standards that came out in 1993 and 1996 and encapsulated, brought those in to this, this particular framework. But more importantly, there hasn't been a publication that came forward since 1996. And all that time, from 1996 until 2012, there's a lot of research that came under the uh, under the eye of the authors of the framework. And this vision statement, I always kind of joke around that this would be a great tattoo if somebody had the 
had great arms to be able to put on their arms. But uh, I say that jokingly, but a good vision statement is one of those things that people want to be able to salute. It's one of those things that, that people really align themselves with. And this vision statement, if you notice, it says all students, not AP student, not honors student, not college career prep student, all students over multiple years of school will actively engage in science and engineering practices, applying cross-cutting concepts to deepen their understanding of core ideas. So the three dimensions that we're talking about are the science and engineering practices, cross-cutting concepts, and core ideas. And there are five innovations that really shift from the framework to make these standards unique. First of all, we want to talk more about it is three-dimensional learning. The second is students engage in phenomena and design solutions, not topics. And that's the way I was trained when I was in free service is talking about topics. This is about what's going to get student interest, phenomenon, and giving them an authentic problem to solve. Engineering, which has always been part of this, the standards before, is now in, integrated within these standards. It's an expectation. Engineering design and be able to understand how to be able to work through constraints, be able to design solutions is an integral part of it, as well as the nature of science. And how those three dimensions move in a coherent learning progression so that in kindergarten to 12th grade, students build on their skill level, students build on their knowledge level. And lastly, and this is something that, that Jeff alluded to in, in the beginning, the connections to mathematics and literacy is essential for this to move forward. So here are the three dimensions, and without going into them in, in detail, if you look over on the right-hand side, these disciplinary ideas when the standards first came out, this is the area that most science teachers were felt most comfortable with because this is what they've really been working with, the content of science. With the exception of where my arrow is now, PS4 waves and their application technologies for information transfer, which is relatively new in the physical science area. And that's primarily because since 1996, the last set of standards, a lot of work has been done and we've moved forward with cell phone technology, computer technology. Um, so it's really was a dedicated idea on the part of the framework to make sure that students that are using this know how they work. Over in the left-hand column, science and, engineering, science and engineering practices, basically this is what we all knew as inquiry. But the framework divided these up into eight specific practices. So if you're talking about inquiry, you could really drill down to what is it you mean by inquiry. It's not just doing a lab. It's about how scientists and engineers actually approach their, uh, their specific areas. How do scientists operate? How do engineers operate? And lastly, cross-cutting concepts. And when I say cross-cutting concepts, that is the connective tissue between all of the, the core ideas. So whether you're life science, earth science, earth and space science, um, physical science or engineering technology, cause and effect runs through all of those. System and system models run through all of those, energy and matter. And so we'll talk more about that in a minute. So just to start off, and I mentioned this about the disciplinary core ideas, this is the content. I guess that's a, probably the easiest way of saying that. This is the, the ideas of science and engineering that we want to have students to be able to build upon. And remember, these are done in a progression so that uh, a third grader is not going to be held to the same content level expectation that an eighth grader would. And likewise, like as an 11th grader would, you build on your understanding through this core, um, the disciplinary core ideas. And I've noticed in the middle, one of the unique things about the NGSS, they are designed to be able to have students do a performance. In other words, when it's not a theatrical performance. But there's an expectation that they're going to be able to use all three of these dimensions to be able to explain phenomena. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. The practices. Next to the core ideas, this is where science teachers felt 
somewhat more comfortable. Once I understand that what we're talking about with inquiry is now broken into specific areas. For instance, if you look at this up close, notice that that practice number one and practice number six have it broken into science and engineering. So scientists ask questions, but engineers define problems. And that's a that's a way in which that you're that you're getting information into it. So the the myth of the scientific method, and believe me, I am one of those people that taught it. There should be a 12-step program for everyone that taught the scientific method. I was one of them. Unless you've gone out and actually done science, and my my uh, rite of passage was going out on a teacher at sea ship for 11 days, and I realized that scientists don't wake up in the morning saying, "I'm going to have uh, I'm going to state a problem." And then they move over to, well, I'm going to build a hypothesis. It's a very organic, very helter-skelter way of trying to figure out uh, phenomenon or design solution to problems. <clears throat> so if you look at, at number six, scientists construct explanations and engineers design solutions. But if you look at the way these are designed, you have one through eight, and they appear hierarchical, but they're not. So actually, Jeff, I'm gonna bring you in for, for a reason with this because uh, Jeff is the, uh, the person I go to when it comes to uh, talking about classroom experience, and especially because he's, he's shared experience not only in the science classroom, but also in the mathematics classroom. So Jeff, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a minute. Great. And uh, Peter's going to still be operating on his computer, so just to let the 70 or so of you know, we're going to have that awkward next slide, please, thing going on here. But this is a PowerPoint that Peter developed, so I think he's he's going to be right on with this. Um, my PowerPoint, my my finger is my computer. I feel like I'm I'm the little kid with the baseball that's just making sure that everybody wants to play. You left out one my, and that's my fault. <laughs> if, it, if, if, things don't, if things don't go well, <laughs> that's where we're going to put the blame. So let's. So this is uh, just a little um, background from as far as where I came at these the NGSS from. Um, I do live in a state where next generation science standards have been adopted. I'm in South Dakota. They were actually one of the first to uh, jump on board with NGSS. And it, that didn't really resonate with me very much. I'm like, okay, great, we got some new standards. And it, it took me a while to get my head around what these were all about. And this page that you're looking at here really helped me a lot. And the uh, cross-cutting concepts also helped, which we'll take a look at in just a moment. But I want to jump to the next slide because on the next one, I think we're going to see something that, ironically has eight numbered statements just like the previous one but if you look at the title here the heading the, the cchs uh, mathematics standards oh there we go the cchs mathematical practices so with the science practices and the math practices the number of them is equal and i i like to think that's not just accidental or coincidental but I would like you just to imagine if you could, even maybe if you take your hand and cover up the heading on this page and just read the eight statements. Now, certainly some of them, a couple of them probably are pretty specific to mathematics, but you can look at almost any one of those and say as a science teacher, or if you're a math teacher, you know science teachers who do things this way in their classroom. For example, I, I'll just pick out one, pick out number four. If we are going to do STEM responsibly, and we're not, and, and we're science teachers or engineering teachers, and we're not doing number four, then we're not doing STEM. Mathematical modeling is what comes after data collection. So we collect data, you're doing some kind of experimental design, we collect some data from it, and then what we do then is model what the mathematics tells us the data says to us. And so that's just one I'm pulling out of here. We'll see more, we'll see this again in a couple more slides, but I just want you to think about um, 
And we high school teachers are the most guilty of any. And, and I was a high school teacher for, like Mike said, a short 34 years. But what I did as a high school teacher and my attitude was my class was more important than everybody else's. And unfortunately, the other six teachers that the kid had during the day thought the exact same thing. And never the group shall meet, sort of. And so we all taught in isolation. Or as I like to refer to it, we all were subcontractors for our particular topics. So if we're gonna responsibly do the teaching thing, which is we're not teaching topics, we're teaching students, then integrating the science and mathematics has to be part of the game. So let's take a look at the next page. And this is just gonna reiterate the uh, science and engineering practices. And you don't have to memorize those, but Take a look at uh, number five here. Use mathematical and computational thinking compared to uh, the mathematics or the CCH, CCSS standards, pretty much the same thing. Now on this page, same thing. We got This looks really redundant, but we're, there is actually a process here that we're going to hit on. And you can see, it doesn't take a whole lot of insight to see, oh, look, there's two of these eight that are really big font now and really bold. This is where we believe, where Peter and I and the entire science implementation team believes TI can make the biggest difference uh, when it comes to implementing the science and engineering practices. Clearly, number four, analyzing and interpreting data. Now, I, you know, I didn't write the practices of standards or the, any of this stuff, but I think it could be logically argued that we could stick in another word in front of analyzing and I don't think Peter would kick me off the team for this, and that is collecting, collecting, analyzing, and interpreting data. Now, not all data has to be collected necessarily, but I would argue that the buy-in from the student is certainly greater if they are collecting their own data. But even so, analyzing and interpreting data is typically thought of, or when I was a kid, was typically thought of as being a math thing, not necessarily a science thing, but with the, with the uh, graphing calculators, the TI Inspire, TI-84, and so on, number four is a, a done deal for, uh, for teachers and students. And then number five, using mathematical mathematics, information, and computer technology in computational thinking. The computer technology that I'm thinking about here is the TI Inspire graphing handheld. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Inspire know that that bugger is way more like a computer than it is like your daddy's graphing calculator. So TI definitely has not only a place in the science and engineering practices and in the NGSS or any standards that you happen to have. I think TI is the answer to some of these practices. So let's take a look at what we have on, on the next page. Okay, so um, let's take a look at the, the main three circles here, math, top left, obviously, science, top right, and then ELA, which is English and Language Arts. Uh, we typically don't get a lot of ELA teachers on these uh, webinars, but that doesn't mean that their subject area should be excluded from what we do. As a matter of fact, it's exactly the opposite. The, the reading process, I don't think anybody would argue that reading is a, a pretty important deal, but the writing and the literacy development that can take place and should take place as science and mathematics standards are hammered at is, I think, clearly obvious on this particular Venn diagram. Now, all of those numbers that are in the numbers and, and letters that are in those circles, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on those. But if you would just take a look at the, at the center, like the bullseye of this Venn diagram where all three of those major circles meet, and it's sort of like a, a light colored blue uh, color in the middle there. And just read through those real quickly, and you can see that all of those are where all these three major subject areas overlap with one another. Peter, anything else you want to add on this Venn diagram? Or No, you did a great job. I just want to point out to the audience that the major point at that center, that sweet spot, if you look at the the mathematics, the M3 and the and the S7, uh, as well as the E5, it's about evidence. We're really talking about not only grabbing evidence, but being able to, if you're going to construct a viable argument and critique reasoning of others, there has to be evidence involved in that. And that's where mm -hmm. mathematics and science really merge together. It's about 
the evidence for their responses and the way they want to be able to move uh, their explanations forward. Awesome. Okay, so let's take a look at the next one. Now this is a, I, I told you we'd be coming back to this and, and we sort of like to keep our word when we make a promise. Here we have Common Core, eight practices on the left, the science practices on the right. And I'm gonna, what I'd like to do is give you maybe 15, 20 seconds just to glance through each side. And I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. Okay. Before I before I do ask those questions, I realize I looked through the the list of attendees who are with us, and clearly I don't know all of you, but I do know some of you, and there are some of you for sure who are in states who have not adopted either of these sets of standards. However, you have adopted standards in the recent past, or you're in the process of developing new standards. And to say that either one of these sets of standards isn't relevant in your state is probably not true. I would say that uh, even if we took off these acronyms, CCSS and NGSS, and just looked at here's what good practices are in math and science, I don't think anybody could argue with that. Uh, if there are components of either of these that, that rub people the wrong way, okay, um, that's fine, but I think it's inarguable that these are really good ideas in both the science and math practices. All right, so, and, and you don't have to play along here, but this is the audience participation opportunity. You are muted, so even if you scream out your answer, Mike won't hear it. But in your, Mike, do you want to use a Q&A or do you want to use a chat? I think you mentioned Q&A before. Um, that might be. Yeah, maybe if they're, if they're just responding, um, the chat would be better. Okay, all right, let's do the chat. So here's what I'd like you to do. As you look at both of these sets of standards, left and right, math on the left, science on the right, if you'd like to participate in your chat window, jot down a word or two that you see would link both sides. So it doesn't have to be the entire set of eight, but if, you, if something jumped out at you, like one of the numerical items, jumped out at you and you said, oh my gosh, that's in the, that's also over on the right side or the left side, whichever one you were looking at first. Uh, throw out a couple, <clears throat> excuse me, throw out a couple of words and Mike's gonna kind of keep track of those and we'll give you a few seconds here and, and then we'll take a look at what you guys tossed at us. So Janet said model, Liz said modeling, Sarah said engaging, uh, Aza said model, uh, Matthew also said modeling. Tom said investigate and interpret. Andy said reasoning. Bev said mathematical thinking. Amy said construct. Nice. Well, these are, these are really good. I can see Sarah, uh, some of you are saying arguing, it's like, hey, that's right up my alley, you know, just being able to argue about things. But remember, in science, it's uh, arguing from evidence. You got that, arguing is one thing, but having the evidence to back it up, like Peter said earlier, is really, really critical. Um, I just glanced at Matthew Gaynard's question, why is precision missing from science? And I hate to be a weenie on this, Matthew, but anything that's missing or isn't there, I'm gonna to have to defer to Peter because he's a pretty humble guy, but he had a pretty big hand in developing some of these. Uh, maybe um, that piece is inherent and just kind of understood in, in science, I don't know. But I that's, like, and we'll that's, get... a, that's a great point to bring up. So each of the, next generation science standards performance expectations, and we're not gonna share them <clears throat> slide by slide for the standards, but if you look at the standards, each set of standards has connection to mathematics and literacy within the, the full spectrum of the standard. Precision is where, where 
where you're, you're going to see a connection directly to this practice within the standard. So that's where the NGSS brings in that practice as a mathematics practice that's an important part of what science does. So you need to make sure that the that that the the responses I have an attention to that precision. So that's an excellent point. But it is where these the, the next generation of science standards does bring in specifically and you can look and see how they're coded grade by grade, uh, not only the practices but the specific uh the specific standard from the CCSS. Excellent. Yeah. And we're really uh we love it when we're able to get people to participate uh, along the way. <clears throat> and since we're at about the halfway point of our webinar tonight, that timing I think was good to get you guys um, sort of interactive with us. Now, we know that if you took a Tuesday night to get on a webinar that had to do with three-dimensional uh, science instruction, we know you're a good teacher or else you're at least striving to be uh, a good teacher or even better than you are. We would like, I, think, I know I speak for Peter and Mike when I say, the best thing you can do for your school and for your students is to share this kind of stuff with the other teachers who might be a little hesitant or a little bit skeptical or a little bit cynical about implementing new standards or any standards for that matter. And to let math and science teachers especially know that there is, there are such strong, rich integration opportunities with, with both the subject areas and to let your language arts, English and language arts teachers know that, hey, we're doing some, some pretty cool writing and reading projects, especially writing, literacy projects in our science and math classrooms. Um, that will one, make them happy and two, uh, make what they're doing seem to be very relevant, which clearly it is. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next slide. I think we've been on this one for a while. And Peter, I'm going to have you take over here and talk about this one a bit. Thanks, Jeff. So um, that was a great setup for, for this piece here. I'm a frustrated musician. I, uh, I like to play the saxophone, but the only thing that sax does when I'm playing it, it scares my cat out of the room. But with that being said, being a musician, I think about a piece of music and thinking about how a good piece of music is going to have a beginning, is going to have a build up in the in the middle, and then is going to have a, a good ending. And think about a lesson. So if you're looking at a science lesson, a good lesson you're going to have students gather information, reason with the information that they that they find. And then and communicate their reason. In other words, what's your explanation? So that center column on the left-hand side, you see that the gather, reason, and communicating comes up. And there's a double-sided arrow. It means that it, it can go back and forth. On the right-hand side, notice those practices that we talked about earlier. And notice where they're categorized. So, for instance, if you're asking questions, defining problems, it makes sense that that's where students are gathering information. If you're planning and carrying out investigations, once they have a question and they have kind of an understanding of where they want to go with a prediction of a possible explanation of a phenomenon, they may design a, an investigation and be able to carry out to get some information. Um, but I want you to point out that models are part of all three because students can use a model to gather information, they can use a model to predict and develop evidence, and then they can use a model to communicate reasoning. All three of those, one of the, 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 the unique pieces about models that I want to bring up is that a model is not just a three-dimensional model. A model could be a mental model, it could be a mathematical model, it could be a lot of things, but they, in a classroom, a model is only as good as the opportunity that educators give the students to explain their models. And that's the beauty of all these practices, is that if they're operating, if students are using these practices, they make their thinking visible. And so moving on, not just the practices, but probably in my opinion, if you, if you were able to see me right now, I'm wearing a T-shirt that says, 
I heart cross-cutting concepts because as important as the core ideas are, and as important as the, as the practices are, the cross-cutting concepts are the, provide the lens by which students can focus in on a phenomenon and be able to uh, start structuring a way in which you explain unique phenomenon in a way that they can explore. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about that. So here are the cross-cutting concepts, patterns and cause and effect. I'm not going to read them. You can read them very easily. But even as young as one and a half, two years old, if you have young children, those, those young children recognize patterns. And the other cross-cutting concepts, they develop over time. Students can make at an early age, can see what something is causing something to do. Rolling a ball, for instance, uh, there's a cause and what the effect is. It rolls away. It doesn't necessarily come back, but sometimes it does. Now, these cross-cutting concepts are ways in which that students make sense of the world around them. And it's not just making sense of the physical science world or a life science world or earth and space science world. These cross cutting concept goes across all those domains. And if you think about it, <clears throat> instead of thinking about those as seven unique cross cutting concepts, <clears throat> excuse me, think of them as being categorized under these three uh, uh, topical organizations. For instance, that top circle, causality. Well, clearly cause and effect is a a process of causality. The reason why something has an effect is something caused it to be affected in that way, or structure and function. The structure of something normally gives a cause to the, the function and vice versa. And then you look at systems in the lower left-hand corner. If you think about a system, you think about a system in terms of its scale, how does it relate with other systems in terms of proportionally, proportionality, uh, is it dynamic, is it stable, is there matter, uh, matter cycling in or out? Is there energy flowing in and out? So the systems aspect is really important. And if you get students to think about systems, that's a major leap forward, especially building from a young age. And pattern stands by itself because patterns are unique in terms of how, how they become an organic cross cutting concept that innately students and adults resource to as a sense-making concept. And it's all about getting students to be able to make sense of phenomena. So this is, let me talk about what a phenomenon is. And you can think about a phenomenon in, in any different ways, but one of the things I want you to think about is a phenomenon is not a phenomenon if you can Google it. If you can Google it and get an answer, it's probably not a phenomenon. It's something that students would want to make sense out of that would provide some great backgrounds for great lessons. And here's a story here. This is just a great graphic um, from Brian Reiser and Mike Fumagalli and Mike Novak. And I use this because when I was teaching uh, eighth grade, I brought in some of my, my ex-wife's perfume, which is probably one of the reasons why she's my ex-wife. It was very expensive perfume. But I walk across the front of the room and I do a spritz here and a spritz there and a spritz there. And I ask the students, raise your hand when you can smell the perfume. And kids in the front of the room raise their hands first, but eventually everyone in the room could, could sense it. And what did I do? Once everybody had their hand up, I would just regurgitate say, the reason why you could do that is a gas and gas takes up the entire space of whatever container it's in and it's a constant emotion. I gave them, oh, gave them everything about it. I gave away the house. So uh, Brian Reiser, Mike Formigali, and Mike Novak said, here's a way you can do that. If you let the students engage in something where they're really excited, like how come we can smell this all the way in the back of the room and you did it in the front, <clears throat> they're going to ask questions. And what we can do as educators is we can build on the question, why can I smell perfume from so far away? And then the students use the science practice to pursue the question. They can develop an initial model to explain the phenomenon. So that role of the phenomenon helps you move from being curious to 
under the, the guidance of educators and facilitating them using practices and the cross county concepts, moving to the area where they're going to seek information and data. In other words, build interest. And then from there, we can get them to use reason and to construct explanation based on evidence. But it's based upon their curiosity that's authentic to them. And so <clears throat> if you think about phenomena, you, you can have students determine cause and effect relationships of the phenomena. So in other words, when they're looking at it, focus in on what caused that, what caused the the the, the molecules of the of the uh, the perfume to, to go way in the back of the room. What is the relationship with that? Or they may say, well, what's the system we're talking about? We're just talking about a classroom, but what happens when we open up a window? So we have to consider the system that we're investigating and what's within that system. And lastly, the students will use these patterns to make sense of phenomena to say, would this work, would this, does this always work in the same way? Is it always this kind of a process that it would happen that it would start from the front and go to the back? How would it happen if we did in the center of the room? Is it the same type of pattern? And so all of this became the, the, the real nexus as far as why TI thought it was really important to bring together the science implementation team. And Jeff alluded to this earlier, that right now, as we speak, we have 19 states plus the District of Columbia that have adopted the Next Generation Science Standards Pure. Com word for word, the way they were written, and I was proud to be part of the 41 writers that wrote the NGSS. And by the way, of those 41 writers, 26 of them were classroom educators that flew in on a Thursday, wrote on a Friday, wrote on a Saturday, wrote Sunday morning, and then flew back to their classrooms for Monday morning. That's a powerful aspect right there. But I want to show you something here that the 19 plus DC, so 20 state agencies have adopted. But I want you to look at this. And I know you probably can't see the notes on the right-hand side, but look at the top row. We have 19 additional 19 states that have adapted the NGSS. Now, when I say adapt, slight word changes. The main thing is they all use three dimensions. And so now we have 39 state agencies that have written standards that are based on the framework in which science educators are using those to guide their, their classroom instruction, their district expectations, and more than likely be able to build their state assessments from that. So here's the problem. And when I talk about problems, what do I do? I hand it over to Jeff Lucan. So Jeff, talk about the problem. Well, Peter, there's nobody on the webinar tonight that's a bigger problem than I am. So <laughs> thank you for bringing that in. And it, you know, you said how many, what, 38, 39 states? 39 states. Out of 50, I think that's a majority, mm -hmm. right? So even if your state doesn't have the, uh, uh, as written carved in stone NGSS standards, chances are pretty good that you can look at this and still get something out of it because of the uh, validity and the, the logic of doing things this way. So let's take a look here. Here's the problem, and, and as a classroom teacher, um, which I'm sh assuming most of you are, this is where I came into this process and where I was skeptical because my thinking was, why would I do this if it's just gonna create way more work for me and if it's going to uh, basically do the same thing, but just accomplish it by filling out a bunch of boxes and checking a bunch of boxes and, on some standards. And here's where, this is where a teacher these days is really burdened by these little four sticky notes here. So, before we get into, yeah, teachers need these instructional materials now, but before we get into looking at uh, the process of developing these, I just want to let you guys know that the team that we had has developed and will be available very shortly three uh, lessons, one for chemistry, 
one for the physical sciences, and the physical sciences one is the one we're going to actually show you tonight, and then one for the life sciences. So we tried to cover uh, as many of the curriculum areas as possible, especially for high school. And these can also be done in middle grades as well. So uh, let's take a look at the process that we went through to uh, develop these activities. And with the time we have remaining, I'm not going to read through all of these things for you. But I just want to highlight a couple of things. If you go from lower left to upper right, this is the process that we use and that is, is designed to be used to develop three-dimensional lessons. Um, I like the, the second box up. Peter kept talking about the word phenomenon. And in science, I think it's not too hard to find phenomena. And maybe some of those phenomena are so obvious, we don't think of them as being phenomena. We just take them for granted. And one of those examples is actually what we're going to show you is our model lesson. But the idea here was to, you could probably celebrate the, or celebrate, substitute the word hook. We want to get the hook in the kid so that we can drag them around wherever we want. They can drag each other around wherever they want. That's what the phenomena is. Why does something happen? Um, which is sort of stating the problem. So then what we did then is use that phenomenon to say, by looking at the, the major components of NGSS, how can we build a lesson that incorporates the components, disciplinary core ideas, and the uh, performance expectations using the cross-cutting concepts to develop lessons? So let's take a look at what uh, – we have one more little slide here that's going to show you the rest of the process. But we're going to look at what's called a coaching template here in just a moment. This is something that we need to give credit to Peter for because he developed this template uh, for these 3D lessons. And here's the model lesson that we're going to take a look at tonight. This one, uh, the young lady that Peter mentioned earlier, Stacy Thibodeau from uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, was one of the team members. And this is the activity that she chose. And the, the kick, the catch here in the hook here is you look in the lesson title, making ice cream. I mean, most people uh, would probably be attracted by that and think, oh, man, maybe we'll get to do that. But essentially, this is a, an activity that all of you have done somewhere along the line in your schooling. If you're a math teacher, you did this sometime probably in physical science or a chemistry class, maybe a physics class. Essentially, it's uh, an activity that shows students the evidence of what's called freezing point depression. And basically, that's how you make homemade ice cream, by actually making liquids colder than freezing temperature by using some components that are very, very simple components that uh, the kid would have access to. So if you take a look here, the, the expectations are in red, the performance expectations. So these are like these specific uh, standards, if you will, that the teacher is intending to develop. And let's go to the next page, Peter, because that's where the, the template is is starting to be located. The phenomenon that we talked about before is right at the top. So adding salt to ice will make it cold enough to make ice cream. Now, one way you can say, will ice make ice cream, is just to try this without the salt. I mean, that's a, definitely a, a, a maybe a control, if you will. Uh, one thing that we could Another extension of this, if you live in a northern part of the country, which I do in South Dakota, uh, we have basically traffic jams of salt trucks all the way up actually through last Wednesday when we got eight inches of snow. Yes, I know it's April, but we still got eight inches of snow. So why another phenomenon could be, depending on the part of the country you live in, why do you put salt on the roads when it snows or when there's going to be ice? And so it's the, the same phenomenon just with different examples. So here we have, uh, if you remember that the vertical arrow that Peter was talking about before with the gathering, reasoning, communicating, here's that piece of the lesson model, the gathering piece, the reasoning piece, the communicating piece, and then we have an assessment. So I think I, think I goofed up. I think the next page actually shows us the template, Peter. Is that right? That, yeah, you're right. But um... What we want to be able to show here is that if you take a look at this lesson, <laughs> this is a lesson that, that most people would be used to seeing. But notice that blue are the practices, green are the cross-getting concepts. 
but if 10 teachers did this lesson, would you have fidelity with the same outcomes? And that the, the next slide is a coaching template that I have to uh, give credit to Cassie and to Stacy and to Jeff to help develop this. So Jeff, you wanna take a little bit more of this and be able to talk a little bit about how this is divided up? Absolutely, if you look on the left side here, <clears throat> the left side is what the teacher is doing before, during, and maybe after the lesson. So we're, we're gonna be gathering some information, we're gonna be developing some reasoning or, or formulating some reasoning from that gathering piece. Meanwhile, the student, you can see, um, looks like the teacher is doing most of the work, but that's not necessarily true. The teacher is just laying the groundwork and getting everything ready to go for the kids and sort of uh, prompting the kids. We'll see some prompts here in a little bit, but prompting the kids with this phenomena, with, with questions and ideas and thoughts related mm -hmm. to this, this, this particular phenomena. So uh, in this one, we actually watch somebody make an ice cream. So this is really, really cruel because we watch make an ice cream at the beginning of the lesson and the kid is like, oh my gosh, I hope I get to do that by the end of this thing. So the kid actually conducts the investigation or the students actually conduct the investigation while the teacher is not idle. The teacher is in the classroom, obviously in the lab area, walking around, making sure she, he or she is answering questions that the kids have and guiding their thinking during this process. So if I can jump in on that, Jeff, <clears throat> The students are the ones that are really doing the work. And even though it looks really busy over here, these are look for so In other words, excuse me a minute, these are what the teachers are looking for, for evidence. If the students are asking questions, the teacher's looking for evidence that the questions they're asking arise from observation of phenomena, are they testimony relevant, are they, did they determine the relationship between variables. And so formatively, the teacher's looking for this as they are observing the students going to these stages of the of the um, of the lesson, and what happens, and here's this area here about crossing concepts that Jeff was talking about, and I will tell you that there have been times where I put together, I work weeks on a lesson I thought was going to be in a journal of science teaching, only to find when they bring it into the classroom, kids are standing around not knowing what to do. And so any good lesson you have that, how do you get students to get started to move towards the phenomena explanation you want them or to solve the problem that, they're, that the lesson is designed? These are, carefully, uh, these are carefully constructed prompts. And if you read those, if you think, think as a student, if you ask a question as a student, what caused the ice to change? It automatically focuses the student towards a cause and effect. They're thinking about causes or they're thinking about systems. And so these prompts actually centered the student on this particular area of the phenomenon which they can try to be explained using the tools which are the practices. And where these came from is we used a number of resources, one being the framework that we saw earlier the other was the next generation science standards that you can access either online or through a, a published book. Or, and, and actually what we want to be able to point out is that where these appendices came into play from this vision and plan for science teaching and learning, they really helped provide some look fors because those, those look fors were developed by teachers in past professional development um, um, opportunities conducted by Brett Molding, Roger Bybee, and Nicole Paulson. And so these are the outcomes for the, what we are looking for with the science implementation team. And believe me, as Jeff was saying, we're gonna publish three. We're looking to be able to bring more people on to be able to de deal with this. But it's a celebration of Texas Instruments because they believe that educators can gain a deeper understanding of the instructional shifts. You cannot do these lessons and Jeff has a great story behind that because Jeff is an advocate for students. Um, but unless you have a chance to deep dive, you really don't understand these standards without really getting into this type of a lesson adaptation process. 
And the, the, I'm not going to go through a, all of these, but I want to make sure that you look at the bottom line, that by developing these lessons, you're actually helping fill in that instructional materials chasm. You're part of the solution. But it isn't easy. And if you talk with Cassie or Stacy or Jeff, um, or if you talk to me, it wasn't easy. But if you think about anything you've ever done in your life that was worthwhile, nothing comes easy that is worthwhile. And you're not going to get a T-shirt for showing up. There's an effort. There's a lot of discussion. And the motto that we came up with is be collaborative, be reflective, and be receptive because there's going to be criticism and you operate positively from the criticism. So, Jeff and I have had a chance to speak and we have a, a little bit of time and I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Mike to be able to see if there's any questions in the chat box that we might be able to respond to. Thanks, Peter. Um, so far, uh, I haven't seen any questions that popped up that need to be answered, but um, we do have a few minutes remaining here, so uh, if anyone was waiting to ask any questions, feel free to get those asked. Thanks so much. While we're hanging on here, I just want to reiterate a point that Peter made earlier. It, he said the, a C word that you may or may not have heard, and that is collaboration. <laughs> if you are, and I'm sure many of you are in schools where it's difficult either structurally or uh, numerically, like you may not have that many teachers, it's very difficult to collaborate with somebody. Um, if you are in a school and you're a math teacher and you're looking to implement more creative math lessons, finding a science teacher to help with that may be a, a really valid and, and valuable place to go initially. And if you're a science teacher who's been striving to find out how do I bring in some mathematical thinking and modeling into this lesson, go to the math teacher and, and uh, collaborate with that person. Most schools will have at least one of each of those. will have a math uh, and a science teacher. When you're doing that, when you collaborate with a person from Another curriculum area, especially if it's science and the math teacher, you are doing STEM. Um, and if you don't have a robotics lab, if you don't have a Lego room, if you don't have an engineering program, you can still, not still, you can do STEM in your classroom all the time. And now this just puts some structure to it so that you, not only do you not know what you're doing, the kids actually know what the goal is for the particular activity that's developed around a phenomenon that they are interested in. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, and maybe, um, Peter, you could answer this question from earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul had a question about why the, the NGSS standards didn't make any mention of, say, attending to precision. Well, I thought we responded to that because they, well, let me let me just share this. One of the things that the NGS has tried to do is not to duplicate what's already out there. So, for instance, they were very aware, we were very aware of what the Common Core state standards are. And we were very aware also <clears throat> that we wanted to make sure that there were connections to mathematics and to literacy. So the Common Core state standards talked about precision. So what the NGSS writers did when they put together a performance expectation, they looked at what are some of the, and matter of fact, the, the writers of the Common Core actually did the alignment for each of the performance expectation. But if you look at these, these standards, they actually list out all of the, the Common Core state standards as well as the practices that, are, that would be resident within that particular standard. So for instance, if the, the standard asks for uh, uh, analyzing and interpreting data as a practice, I would be very expecting that precision, that practice of precision would be part of the mathematical connection. So 
you have to consider that these next generation science standards are not looking at science myopically. They're also looking at how the mathematics and literacy connects to the science. And that is especially true when you're looking at K through five, where you have elementary teachers that have to teach all the subject areas. This was a major uh, positive milestone to be able to make sure that when they're teaching science, the mathematics and literacy components at that grade level is also reflected in the science that they're teaching. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, I, I know you had something you want to mention about the current slide, the Joe DiMaggio day. <laughs> well, if you can if you can hear my voice, you could probably tell that I am a, a New Englander. I'm a diehard Red Sox fan. Uh, so seeing Yankees pinstripe is not exactly my best day. But uh, I put this up here, and Jeff has heard me say this many times, that there was a story a good friend of mine told me about that toward the end of Joe DiMaggio's career, one of his teammates said, you should take the night off because your, your knees are shot, you're hurting, it's really uh, difficult for you to play. Joe's response was, there's somebody in the stands that hasn't seen me play. And I immediately thought about my role as a teacher when I was teaching and something that I think about when all of you join us in a webinar. When you come in and you're, you're as a teacher and you're coming in and, and doing your best for students, despite the fact you have challenges at home, you have children at home, you have bills to pay, but your focus is on kids. And that's what you do every single day. You act, you're just like Joe DiMaggio. You're out there every single day because somebody is really expecting of you. And so with this, what, what Jeff and I want to be able to say to you, when you go back to your classrooms tomorrow or the next day, whenever, every day, we wish you a, a Joe DiMaggio day because you do make a huge difference every single day when you work. So thank you for that. And, and uh, this is our contact information. And uh, many of you know Jeff probably by, you probably have his home phone number. He's so, uh, so omnipresent with Texas Instruments. But please, if we can clarify, or if there's anything you want to reach out, don't hesitate to contact either one of us. Jeff? Mike, I think we'll take it back to you, buddy. Thanks so much. Peter, do you mind uh, giving me control back for just a minute? Absolutely. Here, I'm just going to steal it back from you if you're okay with that. Yeah, go right ahead. Thanks. So I just put in the chat window a link for the certificate and for the documents that um, Peter and Jeff used tonight. Um, if those links aren't working for any reason, feel free to just hang in tight. You'll automatically get a follow-up email in a couple days. And that follow-up email will be a link to the recording, a link to the documents, and a link to the certificate uh, as well. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate of attendance. Uh, thanks so much, Jeff and Peter, for everything you shared tonight. Uh, it was really great to see um, see kind of my, my brain stretched a little bit about what I thought I knew and what I still need to learn. So thanks so much. You bet. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thanks again, everyone, and we hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night. Have a good night, everyone.